Hey guys, welcome to part two of Introduction to Resistance. Uh, now, in case you feel like I maybe haven't defined the term well just yet, uh, or I've been sort of dancing around what resistance is, uh, I have the definition up there at the top of the screen, as you can see. Um, so it, it, what it says basically is that resistance is the opposition that a material has to the free flow of charge through it. As you saw near the end of the, um, uh, the, the previous video, um, any time electrons tried to move through something, um, they would inevitably sort of bump into different nuclei, and that would force them to slow down. So one analogy that's often used for, um, for describing how resistance works is the Plinko board, which if you know, you've never played Plinko before, that, that's okay. Um, the, uh, the, the picture here, I think, probably is self-explanatory. What you have is a ball, um, say, right there, and the, you, the ball is dropped from above, and it hits a peg, and then it bounces and hits another peg, and, and the goal always in Plinko is to predict, you know, where the ball is going to end up, which is kind of fun and basically unpredictable. You never know. Um, but for, you know, this analogy, it's, it's perfect, right? The electron's going bonk, 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 bonk. It just con continually runs into atoms which are in the way, uh, and that interrupts its free flow. Okay, um, now in this analogy, um, if you have, say, more pegs or something like that, that would seem to be like, you know, a, a, more, a greater resistance or something like that. That's, of course, not how resistance really works um, in an actual object. Um, there's three things that resistance is based on, and these are summarized right here in this uh, list, okay? Um, so the first thing to talk about is the nature of the material. The nature of the material is going to be related to um, this thing called resistivity, which will affect a couple of the factors that we've discussed before, one of which is drift velocity. So if you've got a great conductor, the drift velocity, is, we said small, okay, and so it might look like this arrow that I drew here, right? So let's call that a large drift velocity, even though it's small. A worse conductor would have a more pathetic drift velocity, Aww. and so even slower. Or it might have another problem. It might not have as many free electrons. Oh my gosh, half of them disappeared! Well, you know, and it could be even worse, actually. Um, if you have something like, oh, I don't know, a block of wood. Wood is a covalently bonded material. All of the electrons in it are tied up in chemical bonds. They aren't free to move at all, or at least just about at all. It's really hard to make electrons flow through wood because it's wood. Um, so something like a piece of metal has a lot of free electrons that can move around, but if there's a whole bunch of covalent bonds holding the object together, then there's not going to be a lot of free electrons. All right, and so either of those two factors could be related to a larger, what's called resistivity, which is sort of the opposite of conductivity, right? If something is conductive, it has a low resistance. If something is resistive, then it has a high resistance. There we go. That was a very self-evident sentence. All right, so that's the nature of the material thing, right? That's, are we talking about a conductor or are we talking about a resistor, right? Um, so some things just are one or the other. All right, now for the temperature of the material, um, that's going to correspond to disorder in the crystal lattice. Um, there, there, and there's a number of things that can affect that as well, but let me show you what I'm talking about for that one. If this is what your crystal lattice looks like, sort of as a cross-section, and I'm just showing one, let's call it, layer of atoms here, right? And your uh, electrons are trying to move through this. Well, the one on the left, there, it's well-ordered. I know I showed them as tightly packed, but remember there's a nucleus, you know, sort of in, in the, I can't draw a dot in the exact middle with this, ugh. Whatever, the, the dot in the, in the exact middle is supposed to be the, the nucleus, right? Um, and so for, for this one, if this is, you know, what it looks like, then there's well-defined gaps that the electrons can sort of move through, 
all right? So it's low entropy, it's well ordered. The one on the right though, I mean, you can see there's weird gaps here. So you might think, ah, oh, great, electron will just fly through there. Yeah, but the next layer might not look like this at all. And so there's actually an atom right there where the electron would wanna move and it's just gonna crunch into it and that's gonna keep happening. Um, so at higher temperatures, you see more of this going on. Um, the, the atoms don't necessarily migrate around a lot if you have a solid material, but they do jiggle back and forth, right? That's that, you know, that if you have something at low temperature, right, the atoms vibrate at a low speed, whereas if it's at a high temperature, they vibrate back and forth very quickly. And so that's going to correspond to more disorder in the crystal lattice and therefore a greater difficulty for electrons to find a path through the material without running into something and having to slow down. Which is why all superconductors need to be at really freakishly low temperatures in order for them to be superconductive. Um, lead is a superconductor even at like, I don't know, two Kelvin or something, super, super cold. Um, but there are other, quote, high temperature superconductors, which only need to be at the temperature of liquid nitrogen. Oh, very impressive. Uh, but that's considered a high temperature superconductor. You need low entropy, right? A lot of order, or rather a very low disorder in the substance in order to get superconductivity. It is, however, always the case for any substance that at a lower temperature, it will have a smaller resistance. Now, temperature, though, is not something I'm going to have you do calculations with, okay? That's something that you ought to know, but you will not be asked to do calculations related to temperature. Okay, so that's the second thing on our checklist, right? Temperature, all right? Uh, last thing is the dimensions of the object passing the current. Uh, and that's all going to be related to this equation right here. Uh, anytime I ask you to calculate the resistance of something, that's R. As opposed to the resistivity, which is that term right there. Resistivity is some, some number that you'll look up in a table because it is intrinsic to that material. Okay, so if it's gold, it has a particular resistivity value. If it is silver, it has a particular resistivity. If it's cop, okay, you get the message. Um, whereas resistance, the actual, like for this particular object, it's, um, uh, in, it's, resist, you know, it's opposition to the free flow of charge through it is based not just on the identity of the material, that's your resistivity, it's also based on, we said, the dimensions of the object passing the current. So these two things would be, that's the letter L, which is for length. So if you're comparing two otherwise identical wires, and one is one meter long, and one is one kilometer long, guess which one has the larger resistance? Yes, that's right. If it's a kilometer long, it's going to have a larger resistance. Um, the other thing right here, the A, that's for cross-sectional area. All right, I won't write all those words out, but you should. That's the cross-section, okay? So if I'm looking at a wire, I should not think about that area as being the surface area. No, that's not. it's not the surface area. It's the cross-sectional area, okay? So if I have a cylindrical wire like this one right here, uh, like that very poor depiction of one, um, the cross-sectional area would be the area of a circle. I mean, if you had a square cross-sectional wire, it'd be a square or whatever, but usually the A is going to be some kind of a circle because most wires are round, okay? Okay, and so that's, that's how you work with the dimensions. Now let's talk uh, units and then a few other relationships. Um, resistance, that was the letter R, is measured in ohms, which is abbreviated with an omega. I feel like that might be, have been a pun, maybe. Um, Ohm is actually the guy's last name, the guy that sort of first describes um, Ohm's law, which we'll get to in a moment. Uh, and they named the unit of resistance after him, but it's probably somebody's bad joke on us all that um, it's, a, it's an omega, I'm sorry. Okay, resistivity, on the other hand, that was the rho. Uh, in the equation above, I wrote it as rho sub r, 
uh, I slightly regret that. The reason I, I show it that way is to distinguish that from rho for, say, density, okay? So rho can also just be the symbol for density. In this case, we mean it to be resistivity. So I'm sorry, it's uh, whatever, that, that's what I put. So rho sub r has units of ohm meters um, for reasons which you can prove to yourself if you sort of analyze the equation, meaning the equation we had above. So a little bit of algebra, right? If I solve this equation for rho, then I get that it's R A over L. R, resistance, is measured in ohms. A is measured in square meters. And length is measured in regular meters. So that would cancel out one meter unit, leaving you with resistivity as ohm meters. Great. All right, now Ohm's law, V equals I R. This is such an important equation for the rest of this unit. I don't think a day will go by for the remainder of the unit where you will not use it. Um, this one summarizes the relationship between voltage, current, and resistance. So what it is saying is that the current is inversely proportional to the resistance. If you solve that out, it's I is V over R, meaning as the resistance goes up, the current goes down. All right, so thus it is more difficult to uh, you know, pass a current uh, of any size through something with a larger resistance than it is through something with a smaller resistance. Okay, uh, other unit or other equations. Um, power, we're going to start talking about power a lot in this unit uh, because this is kind of when it really becomes most relevant. Um, we skipped, or sometimes we skip over power in the energy unit um, because work divided by time is, it's kind of contrived to talk about it there. Uh, but here it makes a lot of sense. Power is, is watts. And, you know, you've, you've all seen that unit before, but watt is it? Oh, sorry, I couldn't resist the urge. Okay, a watt is a joule per second. So it's the rate at which energy is used. Okay, so if a watt is a joule per second, um, that means that if you have a 60 watt light bulb, it is using 60 joules of energy for every single second that it is turned on. So we'll do some calculations uh, later on where we talk about how many joules of energy are used by that space heater anyway. And um, we have three equations for power. The basic one is current times voltage, um, but I would say that's also probably the one that I use the least. More commonly, you're going to see I squared R or V squared over R, and where these come from uh, is if you take Ohm's law and you plug it into IV. So, for example, if we say just V equals IR, and so I plug in IR for V, that would give me I times IR Okay, which is that one right there. Okay, you could use your imagination for how we're going to get V squared over R. I think that's probably enough information for one video. Um, so we're going to um, break here and move on to the next one in which we talk about a light bulb.